So the paper I'll talk about today is actually my job market paper um, that you know that I wrote uh, you know a, a while ago by now. But it's it's you know like all job market papers is one that's that's very very dear to my heart. Um, and what I do in the paper is I empirically analyze the impact of asymmetric information about collateral values in residential mortgage lending. So it's really about these information frictions. Um, now, in the paper, I focus on one particular dimension of asymmetric information, which is differential information between competing mortgage lenders about characteristics that affect the value of the house. So when you think about, you know, in principle, competing lenders could be differentially informed about at least two important characteristics. The first is characteristics of the borrower. So one lender might know more about, you know, your income process, et cetera, than another lender. But secondly, um, and what's really at the center of this paper is that different lenders might be differentially informed about characteristics of the house that's used to collateralize the mortgage, you know, and um, and both of these sources of differential information might provide a better informed bank with superior information about the expected payoff for making a, a mortgage. Now, an empirical analysis of, of asymmetric information, and you've seen this in, in, in previous papers, is usually complicated by the difficulty of ex ante identifying who the more informed lender is. And so what I'm going to do in this paper is to concentrate on the market to finance um, newly developed properties. Um, and in this market, at least in the US, there's a really interesting feature, which is that the property developers, so the people that built the houses, they oftentimes compete um, you know, cooperate with, with vertically integrated lenders, we're going to call them integrated lenders that are owned by the developer. And these are competing with other lenders, say a Bank of America or Wells Fargo, um, you know, for making the mortgage. So when you go and buy a house, you know, at the end, the developer who built the house might say, hey, why don't you stop in? We have a lender here as well. They might make you the mortgage. And then you might go and you could get a different, you know, a different offer from a Bank of America or a JP Morgan or someone like that. Um, but what you might think is that these integrated lenders Lenders. They could actually have sort of superior information, both about borrower characteristics, you know, things that you learn about the specific borrower in the process of selling them the house, I mean, you know, things like their propensity to maintain the property, etc. Um, but they might also know, um, have sort of differential information about the quality of the house that's used to collateralize the mortgage. And in particular, what's going to play an important role is that this information can be about aspects of the construction quality that are different, difficult to observe, but that are observable, you know, to the to the integrated lender because again they're part of the same entity as the the, the people who even built the house so that's kind of the idea and i'll be much more explicit about the sources of this asymmetric information but i want to give you an example already so that you have an idea about the type of characteristics that, that i have in mind so you know the, so when building a house one of the most important things you need to pay attention to is um is the the care that you do when you pour the foundation in particular when you pour the foundation too quickly um, you know, they're much more prone to crack down the road. Now, at the time when you buy the house, it's very, very hard to know whether or not a specific foundation, for example, was put correctly. But the integrated lender, through its relationship with the developer, has this information about the quality of the mortgage collateral. And so, you know, so these are the types of information frictions that I have in mind. Um, so to give you a sense of these integrated lenders, you know, in the in the specific, um, you know, in the specific markets that I'm looking at, which is in the US, um, in new developments, you know, 70% of homes end up being financed by um, by integrated lenders. Um, so, you know, these are sort of important players in the US mortgage market. They also play a role in mortgage markets outside of the US, but really have sort of a specific focus um, on the US. And so what I do in this paper is I focus on a specific state, really just for data, you know, for the ease of data collection. So I construct a data set of all housing transactions and mortgages in the state of Arizona. And I'm going to use those to empirically analyze the sources and the magnitude of, of superior information of the lender. Um, now, the paper's contribution is really almost entirely empirical. However, to guide the empirical analysis, it's really helpful to briefly think about what we would expect to you know, observe in a market where you have two types of lenders competing with each other who have better information with each other. And one of the ways that you can think about this competition is like a first price sealed bid auction. Right, with differentially informed players. Um, so you know you can think about this as the borrower goes to two lenders at the same point in time and says, "Give me, make me the lowest interest rate offer that you would," and then the borrower ends up picking, um, you know, the the, the interest rate offer um, with the you know with the lowest ones, uh, you know, with the lowest interest rate. Um, and, and so this is, you know, this is kind of the, you know, the, the 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 setup. What's really important is that the different lenders will condition 
their interest rate offers on their superior information, right? So if you go to the integrated lender, the integrated lender will know if this is, a, say, a high or low quality construction house. And so they'll say, if a borrower comes and they want to buy a high quality house, the lender will say, well, you know, I'm going to offer you a low interest rate because I know the collateral is really, really good. Um, and if you go to the, if, if you end up buying a low quality house, the integrated lender might say, hey, you know, I'm going to charge you a much higher interest rate because I know there's a higher default probability because I know, say, the foundation wasn't put all this well. Um, Bank of America can't tell the two apart. And so when Bank of America makes an offer, they basically, those two houses look identical to Bank of America, the same way that they look identical to, um, to, the, to the borrower. And so Bank of America makes the same interest rate offer. And so you can see that what happens then is in equilibrium, what you would expect is that, you know, the high quality homes are more likely to be financed by the integrated lender and the low quality homes are more likely to be financed by Bank of America. And as a result, and these are the first empirical predictions that I'm going to be testing in this paper. As a result, when you then compare the price gains down the road of homes that are financed by integrated and non-integrated lenders, you should expect that those that are financed by integrated lenders, the higher quality homes, have higher ex post capital gains than those homes financed by the non-integrated lenders. And that's exactly what I find in the data. So um, this is just a preview of the results um, because you know we don't have a ton of time. So I want to just give you the high level takeaways to start out with is that the collateral financed by the integrated lender is higher quality and outperforms by about 40 basis points annually. And you know, in the paper, we we address we rule out that this is driven by other possible explanations, such as you know, a bundling or characteristics of the owner or something like that. Um, the second prediction that would come out of this model is that the outperformance of the types of homes that are financed by the integrated lender should be larger when the housing return is more sensitive to the construction quality, right? So you might expect some homes where the price appreciation is independent of the construction quality. And you might expect other homes where the, you know, the subsequent performance um, depends a lot on the construction quality. And obviously, if the information of the integrated lenders about the construction quality, you know, they would should outperform particular for those sets of homes where construction quality matters. And so in order to show you this, I'm going to exploit a very specific feature of this market that I'm looking at, which is that in Arizona, one of the most difficult things when you think about constructing is when you're building properties on what's called expansive soil. So this is something I had no idea about, but I, I enjoyed a lot learning about in this process, which is that, you know, Arizona being a desert state, there's a sort of this soil, which is a high clay content soil. And when it rains, this expansive high clay content soil will soak itself full of water and will expand and will put differential pressure on different parts of the, uh, you know, of the, of, the, um, of the foundation. And, you know, it really, really matters how well you pour the foundation on properties that are built on expansive soil. And it matters much less for properties built on other type of soil. So I'm going to match each house to the type of soil it is built on. And I'll show you that the differential performance of the integrated lender is much, much larger amongst the expansive soil properties than it is amongst the other properties. Um, and then the last prediction you would get is that, um, you know, Bank of America gets adversely selected in this market. What does that mean? It means that Bank of America knows I'm going to make an interest rate offer. And I know that if I make the most attractive offer, i.e. if I make you know, the lowest interest rate, what does that tell me? Well, that tells me that the other lender, you know, in this case, the integrated lender, the one with the high information, actually made a very unattractive offer, right? I'm only the lowest interest rate when the informed party charges a high interest rate. Well, the informed party only charges a high interest rate when it's a low quality collateral. And so I know that the fact that I'm making the most attractive offer contains information that, you know, I'm the, you know, I'm the, uh, that I'm bidding on the low quality um, soil. And so what it should do is the same way that in auction theory, say they're doing bit shading. What it does is it should charge a higher interest rate on average when it's competing against the informed lender, than it charges when it's competing against equally informed lender in order to avoid the winner's curse, which is that, you know, if you make the most attractive of offer, that's because the other more informed parties have not judged the collateral worthy to, you know, to, to make an attractive offer. So again, I'm going to show you that when the same bank makes a mortgage in a, in a development where it's competing with an integrated lender, it charges about a 10 basis point higher interest rate than when it's not competing as an integrated lender. So again, providing information that these types of frictions are important. Um,
Okay, so the types of data I'm going to work with, and a lot of the a lot of the papers today will work with these types of data. So I'm going to combine three data sources. The first is, um, you know, the universe of ownership changing deeds. So these are these are all the transaction data. So it has information on the date, the price, the parties involved, the location of the house and the mortgage. I'm going to combine that with characteristics of the home that come from residential property tax assessment records. So this is, you know, the size, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, etc. And then I'm going to combine that with, you know, information from Hamda on mortgage applications, which, you know, most importantly is information on income, race, and sex of these people. So these are very standard data sets um, in, in, you know, in the sort of, you know, housing mortgage literature, and many of you have seen them before, and you'll see, you know, similar data sets being used, say, by RPED and by other, by other presenters in the subsequent presentations. Um, so I want to start out by giving you a little bit more concrete examples of what we're dealing with. So this is Phoenix, the city of Phoenix in Arizona, and I want to zoom in on some of these developments, because I know we have an audience from around the world, and like, I was shocked to see, like, how, you know, property construction happens in the U.S. relative to, say, how it happens in Europe. So this is an example of one of these developments. And these developments, basically the way you want to think about them is, you know, when developers, they go and they buy a piece of land in the desert and then they start putting in everything. They start building the homes, they start putting in the roads, they start putting in the, the, the football fields, etc. So what you see here is each dot here is a housing transaction in our, in our data set and the different colors um, correspond to different initial developers. So you can see that, you know, developers might, you know, might build two, three, 400 homes right next to each other. They put in all the infrastructure and then they start selling them off. Um, so um, again, let's talk to the first prediction that I now want to go and test, which is in developments with an integrated lender, the capital gains of houses financed by the integrated lender is higher than that of otherwise similar homes financed by non-integrated lenders. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, focus on single family residences um, with repeat sales, because in order to, you know, to explore whether or not they have higher or lower capital gains, what I need is in addition to the initial sale from the developer to the first owner of the house. I also need to observe a second transaction, which is a sale you know, by the first owner of the house to the second owner of the house. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to look at the annualized return between this initial sale by the developer to the first owner and the sale by the first owner to the second owner of the house. And I'm going to you know, regress that on characteristics of the home in a dummy that says whether or not this initial mortgage to the first owner was made by an integrated lender or not. So this is the type of regression I'm going to run. I'm going to run the return capital gains on the house between the two transactions on this dummy of integrated lender. I'm going to put in quarter pair fixed effects. So this is going to remove all types of aggregate house price movement between the first sale and the second sale. And I'm going to put in lots and lots of controls that might also affect um, you know, the, 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 the return, things like characteristics of the house, you know, initial sales price, lot size, characteristics of the owner, characteristics of the financing and the census tract. So really everything else that could explain also why different homes have a differential return. So this is this is um, the, the you know the the, the first set of um, regressions and what what you see is that um, you know the, um, the 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 coefficient is about 0.4 magnitude wise again this is one of our headline results is that those homes that are initially financed by the integrated lender they outperform in terms of their return by about 40 basis points um, you know down the road um, in column two. We start including all of these controls. In column three, we even, um, you know, we even put in, uh, in column two, we put in developer fixed effects. Um, so this is, you know, homes from built by the same developer within the same development, you know, put in the transaction quarter pair fixed effect, you know, and the coefficient basically barely moves. Now, one of the things you would worry about is that there's some type of selection going on, um, you know, in, in, in these types of results. Um, and that might be that the types of homes for which we observe a second sale, you know, which is the selection into a sample might not be a, um, you know, a selected sample. And it might be due to something that affects, you know, th that, you know, people, for example, where the house lost a lot of value or where they gained a lot of value, they're more likely to show up in our sample than somewhere else. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a specific feature of our data, um, which is that it allows us to identify whether or not a specific move was more likely to be an independent decision by the sellers or whether or not it was forced by, by some exogenous event. And so that's what we're going to do in columns, three, uh, in columns four and five. We're going to look at these forced moves. And um, the way we're going to identify forced moves is that in this data, which we have, which is this, you know, the universe of all housing transactions, you see, for example, if an initial owner of the house dies. Why? Well, when someone dies, the, the, the ownership of the house first gets 
and transferred to the estate of the dead person. And then after you know it's figured out who inherits the home, there's then another transaction from the estate to whoever the 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 um you know, the person is that inherits the house. And that's very nice because what we're going to do is we're going to look at only second sales that were prompted by the initial owner dying. So it's got nothing to do with selection based on, you know, things like the, the, the house price development or something like that. But it's really moves that are prompted by the people dying and you find very, very similar effects here. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is rather than run this regression here, where I'm going to look at the average change in the price difference, um, the story that I was telling you before, you know, about sort of, you know, these big construction defects isn't really about sort of a 40 basis point average price difference, but it's about a higher probability of sort of very negative price moves. And in order to show you that, what I'm going to do, it's going to run the same regression, but I'm going to take out this, this integrated lender dummy. I'm going, to I'm going to condition on all the other things, and then I'm going to look at the, the, the residuals, and I'm going to plot the distribution of residuals. And what you can see is that you know, the 40 basis point average return difference between those homes that are initially financed by the integrated lender and those homes financed by another lender doesn't come from a parallel shift in the distribution. But it really comes from the fact that those homes financed by the less informed lenders have a higher probability here at the left uh, part of the return distribution of having very negative outcomes. So it's a higher probability of having, you know, a 10 percentage point negative annualized return. And this is really the types of events that we have in mind where, you know, the action of, you know, the construction defects really lead to the house losing 30, 40 percent of its value. So it's, a, it's another piece of evidence, uh, you know, in favor of the story that, that you know, that we want to tell. Um, Okay, the next question is whether or not, you know, the effects we have are driven by information about the borrower or the collateral, right? So I talked about this being a story about the collateral, and that's what I really want you to take away, that in mortgage markets, it's not only about information frictions about the people, but it's also information frictions about the value of the collateral. Um, but one of the things you worry about is that this could still be driven by better information that the integrated lender has about the initial owner of the house. Again, I said, look, you know, you know, you met that initial owner when they looked around and tried to pick which home they wanted to buy, etc. And that could also be the source of some information frictions. And so, um, so in order to rule that out, what we're going to do is we're next going to look at, um, you know, house price changes during the ownership period, ownership spell of the second owner of the house. So now we're only going to look at the subset of homes for which we see three transactions. The first is the initial sale by the developer to the first owner. The second is you know, the sale by the first owner to the second owner. And then we see a sale by the second owner to the third owner. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the annualized return between you know, the last two sales here. But we're still going to regress that on whether or not the initial mortgage was made by an integrated mortgage lender. And what's really important is that the only thing this initial lender could have known about the second ownership spell was the collateral. Right, that stayed the same. It's still the same house, but nobody knew who the second owner of the house was going to be. And so, if the inter, if you know, the fact that whether or not you got a mortgage by an integrated or non-integrated lender up front still predicts whether or not your return is higher or lower during the ownership period of the second owner of the house. That can really only be due to information about collateral values rather than information about um, about borrower characteristics. Um, and you know, in the data I'm showing you, and I, you know, I'm not going to walk you through this, is that the outperformance of these other horizons is equally high. So it really looks like what we're dealing with here is information that's not, you know, that that really is about um, that's about um, characteristics of the, you know, of the, the the collateral in the house, and not characteristics that are specific about the borrower. One of the things we worried about also was whether or not one of the things that could be going on is is some sort of bundling. Um, of the of the um, you know of the the house and the mortgage. So here's the story we worried about. We said, look, maybe you know the what was going on is that you know people said, well, if you take the mortgage from you know from our integrated mortgage lender, we'll make some money on the mortgage. So in order to attract you to that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock a few thousand dollars of the value of the house, right? And so the initial sales price would have then been too low for the integrated lender homes. And then if you sell it at market value down the end, you would have had sort of higher returns. And But it has nothing to do with sort of information friction, but it's just the bundling of the initial um, mortgage and the house. And, you know, the same sort of, you know, results that show that the, you know, the results persist of the ownership period of the second owner of the house, um, you know, that, um, that confirms that the first thing can't be happening. Um, something else that we do is we don't just look at the, the, the transaction prices, but we actually, you know, now get data on the textual descriptions of property listings. 
right? So when the house gets resold, and we're going to look in the text, and what we're going to do is we're going to look for words that indicate substantial damage to the home. So there's like three types of things that you know you want to look out for in property listings that signal that this is a house with substantial structural damage. The first one is that people say you buy this property as is, right? So we're not going to do any fixes or anything like that. The other thing is people might actually talk about things like this home needs work, or they might explicitly mention cracks or damage or something in the property listing. And the last thing is, you know, when when they uh, indicate that this is home is really attractive, you know, for a special type of buyer, a handyman or an investor, or what they just quite often call the right buyer. And so what we do is we we show that those homes that were initially financed by an integrated lender are less likely down the road to contain these types of you know damage indicators in the textual descriptions of the property. And so it's again evidence that you know the information asymmetry is really about the, the collateral value and not about the borrower characteristics. The last piece of evidence that I'll show you in this direction is that you know in addition to this sort of baseline effect, there was the second prediction that we had, which is that the outperformance of the integrated lenders housing collateral is larger when the housing return is more sensitive to construction quality. And, you know, I already highlighted what I'm going to do here is I'm going to exploit geographic differences in soil types. So let me uh, let me just show you explicitly what I mean here. So I'd already talked about this expansive soil, this high clay content soil. That's a big problem in Arizona. And so this is from a you know from a civil engineering textbook that I got, and it just very you know concretely tells you what the problem is, which is that when this expansive soil moves and puts this differential pressure on the foundations, right? You know you're going to get substantial cracks in the floor, or substantial cracks in the walls. And here's actually some pictures um, from. Phoenix from houses that had these substantial property damages, right? You can see why these types of damages would reduce the value of homes by so these 20, 30 percent that we saw in the left tail of the distribution on the previous picture. And so what I'm going to do is, you know, and, and what's important is that, you know, this type of expansive soil is something that's well known, right? So here are two quotes from the Arizona New Times, a local newspaper that described this in 2006 and said, look, with proper engineering and careful attention, most soils in Maricopa County, which is, you know, Phoenix, could be built on without too much trouble. The problem is that some builders aren't taking the trouble. Builders are frequently ignoring their own soil reports recommendations. The reports typically recommend stronger foundations, but some builders just resist them, citing costs. So basically, this is something where if you have a careful team that does a good job, it's not a problem to build on expansive soil. But if you're not careful, you know, down the road, you're going to start seeing, you know, these types of cracks in your home. And so, um, you know, and so what this means is that the return of houses built on expansive soil is really particularly sensitive to these unobservable aspects of construction quality that we mentioned before. And so what you would expect is that, you know, for those homes built on expansive soil, whether or not you're financed by an integrated lender really, really determines the subsequent house price changes, much more so than for homes built on less sensitive soil. Um, and so what I do is I want to go back to this you know, development that I showed you before. And so I get data on the soil reports. And this is something cool. So the US Geological Service actually has sort of data on the exact soil distribution everywhere in the US. And so you can see that even within the same development, some houses are built on this really difficult soil and others are not. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to match every house to the type of soil it is built on. And then I'm going to show you that indeed those houses built on expansive soil are the types of houses where the integrated lender outperforms relative to the others. OK, now what's really, you know, I'm going to stop here in terms of showing you results. Um, because I want to spend my last two or three minutes before I'm going to hand over to Teresa to just give you some sort of other insights that I, or, or other sort of things I learned in the process of writing this paper. So one of the things you, you know, you saw and you got some flavor of, you know, in this presentation, and you'll get much more of, you know, if you actually read the paper, is that this is one of these papers, and I've mentioned this in previous classes, whether it doesn't have like clean research design, right? It doesn't have a instrumental variable strategy, it doesn't have a regression discontinuity design, right? What it has, it has a story that I thought was correct. And then it goes through this process of saying, look, first of all, it thinks through a simple model of if that story is correct, what are things that we should expect to see in the data, right? And so, you know, these were the tests, like houses financed by integrated lenders, you know, should have a higher return than that of ex-antisimilar homes financed by other lenders. And, you know, that difference should be bigger 
you know, for the types of settings where construction quality is most important. And then I was going through and I was trying to find ways in the data to provide evidence for this. So, you know, as I was reading about this, say I learned about these different soil types and I said, well, maybe this gives me, you know, the type of variation that I'm looking for to provide additional evidence that what's really going on here is, um, you know, is, is the story I want to tell and not some other story. And I said, well, maybe this textual description from the property listings, maybe that gives me an additional data set, et cetera. So really this is, you know, this is, I've said this before, I call this the, you know, show a correlation and then rule out other plausible alternatives, research designs, right? You really, you first show that, you know, the, the predictions from the, you know, from the theory bear out in the data, but then subsequently, you really have to say, well, you know, could it also be information about borrower characteristics, right? And say, well, if it were that, I wouldn't expect it to show up over the ownership period of the second owner of the house. So, you, you know, you try and show that it still shows up there and therefore that's evidence against the borrower characteristic story, et cetera. So you really, you know, and, and I would encourage you to, you know, to, to think about using these types of research designs, not just trying to always look for a, a perfect instrument or a perfect regression discontinuity or something, because quite often those don't exist. And, and you know, sometimes some of the more interesting questions we have are ones that are much, much, you know, that, 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 that won't be answerable with sort of clean, research designs, but we can go a long way with these types of research designs, um, you know, where you just bit by bit show evidence in favor of your story, bit by bit you show evidence against competing stories and you build a narrative, you build a body of evidence and by the end you say, look, you know, can I rule out with 100% certainty that it's not something else? And the answer, like in all empirical work, is probably not. Um, but do I think you know, based on this, you know, accumulated body of evidence that my story is much more likely than alternative stories. And, you know, if the answer is yes, then that's already quite successful. So in some sense, you know, this is, uh, this is, um, you know, sort of a, a story, um, you know, that, that I want to reemphasize because I feel quite often people, you know, get the sense that it's not worth doing a paper, not worth working on a paper unless you have the perfect, you know, research design. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is no research design is perfect. And, you know, and, and, and for some questions, um, this sort of, you know, storytelling combined with just, you know, creatively accumulating sort of lots of evidence in favor of your story and against competing stories is one that's really worthwhile thinking about.